honoring the sacred complexity of choice. If we take in the full meaning of each of those words, we are indeed honored to be here for today's book launch and conversation. Hi, I'm Reverend Carrie Jackson, and I have the privilege of serving as Director of Spiritual Care and Activism for RCRC and the privilege of working with Katie Zay. Today, we are grateful for the work of RCRC that spans almost five decades as we seek to bring the moral force of religion to protect and enhance reproductive freedom through education, prophetic witness, pastoral presence, and advocacy. We are so honored to hold this space for each of us to engage in this important conversation today. And it weaves itself wonderfully with some important work that RCRC is doing. I'm gonna name just a few because we're gonna to get to our speakers. But one thing I'm delighted to tell you about is our Religion and Repro Learning Center. We are the only curator of this type of learning resource, educational resource, and we have online courses and webinar series and an incredible resource library. So if you don't know about the Learning Center, be sure to go on the website of rcrc.org and learn more about that. We are also glad to be the host of clinic blessings in places across the country, reminding clients, patients, staff, physicians, and the community that there are hosts of people of faith across this country who support the sacredness of abortion care and the sacredness of all aspects of reproductive decisions. So, so much more I could tell you about RCRC, but we're gonna hop in right now and get to today's important conversation. So you will have opportunity at the end to participate in Q&A with Katie. And so there is a Q&A box. Please make sure any questions you have, you put those questions in that box. All right, please do that. I'll remind you again later. So now we are going to begin hearing remarks from a special guest who is the individual who wrote the foreword to A Complicated Choice, and that is none other than Alexis McGill Johnson, President and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Alexis has been part of the Planned Parenthood family for over a decade as board member and board chair, and she's been in the movement for reproductive rights and racial justice her entire career. A researcher by training, Alexis co-founded and co-directed the Perception Institute, a consortium of researchers, advocates, and strategists who translate cutting edge mind science research on race, gender, ethnicity, and other identities into solutions to reduce bias and discrimination. Alexis, so glad you are here with us today and I turn the stage over to you. Hello, thank you so much, uh, Reverend Jackson, and thank you all for joining. I am Alexis McGill Johnson, the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America, and I am so grateful for the chance to welcome you all and to congratulate my friend, Reverend Katie Zay, on her amazing book, A Complicated Choice. Katie asked me to write the foreword for this book. And of course I said yes immediately, not just because Katie sits on Planned Parenthood's clergy advocacy board, but because this is an important book at a really critically important time. When I first got to read the book, two things inspired me. First, just how storytelling is at the heart of the movement for reproductive freedom. Our brains survive on stories. 
We are hardwired to use narratives to make meaning. Our own narratives help us reconcile who we wanna be and who we deserve to be. We can use what we know about the mind sciences to our advantage. When we share abortion stories, we're actually building new strong archetypes against stigma. Second, Katie inspired me to talk about how I connect to my own faith. And in reading this book and writing this forward, it was a moment for me to recommit to my own practice because if I ever needed a higher power, it is right now. You all know that the right to abortion is hanging on by a thread. You've heard what's going on in Texas. It's been more than five months since Texans could access abortion after approximately six weeks before many people even know they are pregnant. Already this legislative session, Florida, Arizona, Ohio, Wisconsin, South Dakota, Alabama, Oklahoma, and Missouri are considering copycat legislation. And of course, the Supreme Court is considering Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, a case that could unravel Roe v. Wade and the right to abortion once and for all. A majority of justices seem poised to at least let the Mississippi 15-week ban stand, if not repeal Roe outright. Either way, we have never been closer to losing a fundamental constitutional right. And if Roe falls or is rendered meaningless, 26 states could move to immediately ban abortion. That could affect 36 million women and even more people who can become pregnant. The urgency of this moment might lead many of us in this moment to fear to worry that our words will get twisted or we'll tell the wrong story and the movement will suffer a setback. But when it comes to abortion, there is no wrong story. Every story is challenging our bias, complicating the narrative, cutting through the stigma that isolates us. Every story is actually an invitation to share more stories. Nearly one in four women in this country has an abortion in her lifetime. Those stories have incredible power to change our culture but they are bottled up and silenced. The great challenge and opportunity of this moment is to unleash that collective power to reimagine, to rebuild the infrastructure of our rights and freedoms around a new standard. But to do that, we have to create space for all kinds of narratives. I said this in the forward, and I think it sums up the work we all have to do in this movement. Sharing a story that you've been told to hide is a radical act of defiance. Choosing to witness that story without judgment or prejudice is a radical act of grace. And in that space between the telling and the hearing, the spirit is at work. I wanna thank Katie for her grace. I wanna thank the 19 storytellers in this book for their courage. We have so much to learn from this book and the lessons have never been more urgent. I'm incredibly proud of you, my friend and grateful to have been a small part of this amazing book coming forward. Thank you. Alexis, thank you so very much for opening this conversation today and thank you for your forward. It is my privilege now to introduce the next people we will get to hear from today a wonderful conversation between Rabbi Danya Ruttenberg and Reverend Katie Zay. And I will give you very brief introduction about each of them. Rabbi Danya serves as the scholar in residence at the National Council of Jewish Women. She is an award-winning author of seven books, including Surprised by God, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Religion and Pursue the passionate Torah. And Danya has been named by Newsweek as one of the 10 rabbis to watch and by the forward as one of the top 50 women rabbis. She's currently working on a book on repentance and repair in the public square, institutions and national systems. Rabbi Danya will be in conversation with Reverend Katie uh, who joined the RCRC family as a 20-something-year-old seminarian trained by RCRC's Spiritual Youth for Reproductive Freedom program. In 2015, she became the youngest board chair ever elected to lead RCRC and now serves as CEO. Reverend Katie is an ordained Baptist minister and the co-host of the monthly podcast, 
Kindreds, a show about faith, feminism, and, free, and friendship. And she is, in addition to author of today's featured book, is the author of Women Rise Up, Ancient Stories of Resistance for Today's Revolution. Yay. Wow. Happy book birthday. Oh, thank you, my friend. I'm so delighted to be here and to be celebrating with you. Um, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, what's the genesis of this project? How did this book come into being? I want to be really transparent because I think it's easy when you have the finished product to pretend like it was a smooth <laughs> process and it was not because I did not want to write this book. <laughs> <laughs> I did not intend to write this book. I wasn't intending to write any book. It was June of 2020. I had just put out my first book the year before. And we were three months into the pandemic. I'm running our CRC from home. My husband is running his company from home. We have our kid at home. It was not an ideal time to be writing a book or taking on any kind of big project like that. But it just happened. I was connected with my now editor, Lisa at Broadleaf Books, and she encouraged me to pitch some ideas. So the original book that I wanted to write was much broader about reproductive loss that included abortion as one of a lot of different topics that I was going to cover. But then Lisa came back to me and she said, our team really, really wants you to write the book about abortion as a loss for some people who need to grieve and to heal. And I think my stomach drops. I was like, oof, <laughs> entire book about abortion, like as someone who works in this space all the time, I have encountered many protesters and trolls. I mean, you know, Danya, what that's like to, to be doing this kind of work. And even for me, that was a really daunting idea to put my name on a book that was just about abortion and to talk about it in this way. Like, was I prepared for that? Um, I said, yes. And what I came to realize was just how needed these kinds of conversations are because so many people don't feel like their abortion experiences fit within these tidy scripts that are what I would call like the publicly acceptable stories of abortion. I, there's two that I see, one's from the anti-abortion side, which is abortion was terrible. I wish I had never done it. I regret it. And on the pro-choice side, there's often this idea that abortion is easy and it's not something that anyone thinks about after. And those are real experiences that people have, but there are so many other abortion stories don't, that don't fit into either of those. And as someone who got started in this work in a very intimate and pastoral way, which I talk about in the book, I was frustrated by the lack of space that there was for us to encounter and hold compassionately the, the people and the stories that are much more complex and nuanced. And so I wanted to offer a way for us to learn collectively how to hold that tension of affirming abortion experiences that don't fit nicely into our political talking points, but that are beautiful and fully human. So, you know, I kind of want to ask two, two questions at once. So maybe I'll just ask them both at the same okay. time and you will answer them in, in whatever way I want to know. First of all, how the process of, of doing this book and entering into, I mean, the, the book, which I have gotten to read already and is so powerful. Uh, and so, so meaningful. Um, you really enter into the, the complexity and not everybody's story is different. Every abortion story is its own story and everybody's got their own experience and, and emotional shades and weights and things that they need and things that they need materially and emotionally and spiritually. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'd love to know what that process of getting into and hearing and witnessing and, and listening and showing up for the people and their stories did, did for you over the process of, of doing this book and what you think uh, that could do for us as a culture to get out of this binary thinking. And if we were all able to hear these stories in all of their fullness and make space for everybody's experience in their fullness. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try to tackle the first part the and, then, and then the part. second part. Right. right. Writing this book really reconnected me with why I got started in this work. And I think as someone who is now in leadership, 
sometimes I lose sight of the people who are most impacted. It is just the reality of, of doing the kind of managerial work that a CEO does as much as I love that. It really did. It helped me remember what, you know, my call to ministry in the walls of an abortion clinic uh, when I was in my early twenties. And it helped me to remember, even though I knew it, that abortion is never abstract. It always happens within the context of a full person's life. And there are a lot of similarities and overlap in the stories as you read them. But as you were saying, each person's experience was unique and informed by a very particular set of circumstances that were both individual and tapped into the collective that led them to need to terminate a pregnancy. And I realized that even though I've heard so many abortion stories over the last 15 plus years, there are so many that I hadn't heard before. And I really found myself expanding and stretching my own kind of compassion muscles that I have um, and doing more internal work of interrogating my own internalized abortion stigma. I think that that is ongoing work for, for all of us. So there was so much learning that happened for me. And I knew before I wrote this book that I believed abortion was a moral good. And I had seen that operating in people's lives, but to hear it as something life-saving and life-affirming and as a blessing, abortion as a blessing, as a catalyst for incredible change in a person's life. It really emboldened me in the way that I talk about abortion um, in a way that creates space, not only for the grief and for the loss and the hard feelings, which we definitely need, but also for the beauty and for the love and for the learning and the growth that people experience as a result. So it, it really did reconnect me to my purpose. And I'm really, really grateful for that. You know, I think, I think collectively, there's a lot that I can say about, about what this process can do for us. But I think in general, our dominant culture of whiteness and patriarchy and Christian supremacy really limits the kinds of experiences that we feel like we're allowed to acknowledge and to grieve. And it's not specific to abortion, but I think abortion, abortion is one of many experiences where we just simply do not know how to hold space for each other. And I met this amazing psychologist early on in the project who I talk about in the book named Dr. Den Ken Doka, who introduced me to the idea of disenfranchised grief, which once he explained it to me, I understood, but had never heard before. And that's a loss that isn't affirmed by our communities as a loss. And we're sometimes reticent to name as a loss ourselves. So it's this compounding of loss that happens where we're feeling the loss itself and then the lack of acknowledgement that we're experiencing a loss at all. And it makes processing that experience so much more difficult for people. And there are lots of different kinds of reproductive losses that fall under that understanding of disenfranchised grief. You know, I don't think we like to talk about abortion in a fully human way. We talk about it in abstract ways often, and that avoids some of the messiness when we can stay in those talking points and we can avoid dealing with our internalized abortion stigma. Um, I think that this is really important because just living in this culture in which the anti-abortion movement, which is so intertwined with white Christian nationalism as a political movement, that we are all exposed to the idea that abortion is wrong on some level, no matter where you stand politically, we, we all absorb that message even if we don't consciously believe it, we have to do that work of recognizing the ways that we've absorbed this idea, just as we internalize sexism and racism and all the other isms. So this is really uncomfortable work that we avoid. And yet when we do it, it is so liberating and it allows us to transmute that judgmentalism into compassion for each other. It's beautiful. Um, and so sort of, bringing on that, that compassion and, and like bringing that compassionate energy forward. So what, for those of us who care about abortion justice and are committed to it, what are some things that we can do to better care for the spiritual needs of those who are most impacted by, by abortion, people who are having abortions or are making decisions or people who are struggling to get abortion care because they are in states that are passing bans and the like, right? Absolutely. And the, the need for that is going to increase in the coming months. I think we're all preparing for that. And so it's a really 
good question. And in the book itself, my last part of the book is about the practical of what we can do. So I want to encourage people to read that. And I will definitely share some of the learning that I have from my own work. But before I get into that, I want to share another lesson learned for me from writing the book, which is I didn't care for myself when I wrote this book. It's really hard work to to be engaged in this movement, even if you're not personally impacted in the sense of having had an abortion, it's a lot to hold this space. So I want to say, if you're someone who is looking to get involved, like really caring for yourself, first of all, affirming that you're, that you do care. That's a big thing. That actually means a lot. It's not insignificant to care about this and want to accompany people through their experiences. So we have to have compassion for ourselves you know, and to care for ourselves, even as we center people who are most impacted. So please, please, please be good to yourselves as you do this. Um, and I tried to model in the book a way of learning how to do this accompaniment in a way that I hope is not saying that you've done anything wrong, but that we're all learning and growing together. So I hope that the book is very invitational because we really do need we really do need all of you who care to be part of this work. Please, please come join us. Then I would say before you can really help anyone, you do really need to do the internal work or to do it alongside the work of helping people. Because as I said before, we all have abortion stigma. It is not our fault, but it is our work to examine it and work through our reactions to when we hear about someone who's had an abortion and to look at our values and what informs them. And do we wanna hold on to those values or do we wanna replace them with something different? And if we don't do that work, we risk causing more harm without realizing it. So spend some time with this book and the stories in it. You can read stories of abortions elsewhere at organizations like We Testify and just practice holding space for people's stories while being mindful of your own reaction to them. So really do that grounding work um, as, you're, as you're engaging. That's ongoing work we all need to do. And beyond that, like I said, there's a section in the book that goes into some practical ideas of what we could all be doing better. But I do think that faith communities have a very unique role to play. And that is to hold space for people to share and to hold that space with compassion um, and affirmation. And when I think about what guides me theologically in this work, it's really the belief that we all have the divine within us and that we know deep down what we most need. And that includes people who are contemplating whether or not to end a pregnancy. So oftentimes what people need isn't advice. <laughs> it's really that support in the space and sometimes even ritual to work through some of the difficult feelings that come up. And we can provide that kind of loving and compassionate accompaniment that can be so healing from the shame and the stigma that people experience as they go through an abortion experience. I am so grateful for you. I am so grateful for all of your holy work. I'm so grateful for all of the ways that you just exist in the world and teach us every way and every day. And I'm so grateful that this book now exists and that people can buy it and learn from you in a really concrete way. So thank you to everybody who's here because now you can learn here and, and access this book as a source of ongoing wisdom. So thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you for being an early reader and supporter and advocate for this book. Um, and for all the work that you do through the National Council of Jewish Women organizing rabbis for Repro, we're so grateful for your leadership too. And it's wonderful to be partners in this work with you. So thank you for being here today. It means a lot to me. Yay. Thank you so much for that conversation, Rabbi Danya and, and Reverend Katie. And two things in particular that speak to my heart. One is that Abortion stories are not something in the abstract. Everyone has the context particularity of their own lives. And the other thing was that there is this internalized abortion stigma that so many, and perhaps all of us live with because it's part of the toxicity in the air that we breathe. And so this next part of the conversation will be with one of the individuals who shared her abortion story. And I'm so glad to welcome to the stage, Reverend Kaylee McAvoy, 
who is the associate minister at Westmoreland Congregational UCC in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, Reverend Kaylee received her Master of Divinity degree at Union Theological Seminary in New York City, where she encountered the legacy of the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion while working as a student intern at Judson Memorial Church, serving as community minister there. Kaylee, welcome. So glad to have you here today. So hey. good to be with you all. Hi, friends. Hi. Thank you, Carrie. Hi, Katie. I'm so glad you're here. You it's are good. such an important person in my life and to this project. So it means so much to me to have you here today. It was critical to have a storyteller be part of this conversation hmm. uh, because you all are the reason that this book exists. So I'm really grateful to you for being willing to be part of this conversation. And you were one of the first people that I approached about sharing your abortion story when I was just starting this project. And you said, yes, I'm so grateful. Mm -hmm. So tell mm -hmm. me about your yes. Why did you wanna be part of this book project? Mm, that's a good, tell me about your yes. I love, I love yes. that. <laughs> I love that framing. And thank you for the, for the invitation to say yes. Um, I wanted to be a part of this project because I knew that my experience of receiving an abortion was both unique and wasn't unique at the same time. Um, there's a lot in my own story that is based in class privilege and race and socioeconomic privilege. Um, I grew up in a liberal small town in New England had access to birth control when I was 16. When I was living in New York City in graduate school, I did have private insurance, um, was in a loving relationship, kind of all of these check mark things. I was working at this incredible congregation, Judson Memorial Church, um, who had this long history of reproductive dignity work. And still my abortion experience was really hard. I had all of these resources and it was still really messy. Um, so I knew that in sharing my story, um, that as you have taught us through these many stories, that nuance would be present um, and it would also be held uh, in, a, in a loving way. Uh, it was of course helpful that we had a little bit of a relationship beforehand. Um, so it wasn't wasn't zoom in talking about vulnerability with a stranger. So I knew that your kind of pastoral care was also gonna be important in me um, saying yes to, to that story. Oh, that is beautiful. Yeah, I, I was really grateful that I could interview people like you who I did know, and that I did talk to strangers. And I think about both of those experiences having different kinds of vulnerability, yeah. right? Yeah. Cause we had talked a little bit about your abortion experience, but not, mm -hmm. not in depth in the way that yeah. we did when I go back to what maybe July of 2020, I think it was when mm -hmm. it was. Mm -hmm. So could you maybe think back to that time where we're sitting on zoom in the middle of the pandemic and you're telling me your abortion story fully. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was that like sharing I, it? I do think it's, it's important that you underscored the word fully there. Um, because we had talked about it before, you know, I had disclosed with family members and friends that I, professors that I cared about. Um, but there is something interesting when you do go through a traumatic experience that different memories go to different places. So like the whole timeline of the two months or one week or, you know, different um, timelines during my reproductive decision-making process, it does get scattered. Sometimes it was very clear, so, you know, so in being able to fully intentionally, I could even say ritualistically talk about it with you, um, there was kind of an empowerment to re-narrativize my story 
in a way that felt empowering and real and full to me. Um, there was almost, I think like there was absolutely a healing in that. Um, mm. People often, often say as a preacher that I am um, preach from your um, scars, not your wounds. Um, and I think some of the work that we did and sharing the story kind of built up my scar tissue um, in, mm -hmm. in a beautiful way to be able to um, share my story more broadly. Oh, that's so beautiful. And it reminds me of, there's a part in the book where I talk about the gospel story of the hemorrhaging woman and that she's healed not only because she reaches out and, and touches Jesus's garment and is healed physically, but she's healed in the telling of her story, not yeah. just to him, but to the community. Yeah. And something that has been amazing for me to watch you do. And actually this has evolved even since you said yes to this event, which is you have since preached about your abortion in your congregation and you were the lead in an article in the Washington post with your picture right up there about, about this journey. That's huge. That's really, really big. So what, um, what has shaped your process of going from talking to me, knowing it was going to be in the book, but then speaking in your own voice in front of your congregation and honestly to the world in this yeah. piece that you did in the Washington post for the Washington post, what has that been like for you? Yeah. Um, it has been fast and scary and good. Um, <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's what happens when you say yes, right? Spirit moves that way. Um, but, it, but it has also been um, a grounding and humbling experience. Um, I did not set out in November the week I was slated to preach and said, this is the week I'm going to preach about my abortion. Um, <laughs> it was really like um, what happens when you do scriptural exegesis, like spending time with the text that week um, and hearing this thought that people need to be known and loved. Um, and that was the name of the title where I talked about my abortion with my congregation. Um, there was actually a friend that I spoke with earlier that week in kind of my writing process who was just kind of vulnerable about not wanting to share her full self with new friends. Um, and I just wanted to tell her like, God loves your full self. Um, mm -hmm. And thought about a time when when I had felt that from God, when I had felt that God loved my full self. Um, and that was in the halls of a Planned Parenthood on Bleecker Street. Um, so that decision to preach about it did feel very scripturally based. Um, and it also felt right with my congregation, um, Westmoreland Congregational Church um, in Bethesda, Maryland. We had been on Zoom for a while. Um, and we were back in the sanctuary together, which meant we were embodied together again. Um, and it felt important for me as someone who is really grounded in an in incarnational embodied theology to bring my own body into the space. Um, so the moments before preaching were, were jittery in my body, um, but the moments after preaching um, were just full of love in my congregation. And I'm so grateful for them. There was a lot of hugging at a time when it was like still kind of awkward to hug, like, you know, consensual, can we do this with masks on? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it did open up kind of a vulnerability in our congregation um, that perhaps wasn't there before. Um, our senior minister a couple weeks after preached um, from the pulpit about bisexuality in a way that hadn't been talked about before. So I think it kind of opened up um, this space that as you know, was kind of modeled in the book, like when one of us is brave, we can all be more brave together. Yeah. I was going to ask a follow-up to that, which is what has the response been, not just in the immediate, but have you seen kind of fruits of your labor in the sense of opening up space since sharing your story, both in your congregation and again, in this article? 
Yeah, I I think in in both instances, um, there's just a lot of me too's mm-hmm. or a lot of my friend from middle school too, or I haven't told my children yet, but one day maybe I will. Um, so I think, you know, like the plethora of storytellers in your um, book, I have just received the gift to hear more stories in telling my story. That's awesome. And it, it parallels my experience of just even talking about the concept of this book. You recognize how hungry people are to share and how many times that is the first telling of a story that people have sometimes been holding for decades. And I think again, when I remember the hemorrhaging woman and her courage to tell the truth that there was healing that happened among the people who heard her story, who probably then maybe turned to her and told her that their story. Yeah. I do think that there is kind of a domino effect that can be, we don't just heal ourselves. We help each other heal too. Yeah. I'm really grateful for your, for your bravery and truth telling. So I'm going to ask you a question that Donna kind of asked me, but I want to hear from you as someone who's in a pastoral setting and also someone who has experienced abortion, which is how can people of faith like us, either who have experienced abortion or people who love those who have had abortions, as Renee Bracey Sherman says, everybody loves someone who's mm-hmm. had an abortion. Mm-hmm. How can we show up better mm-hmm. and more compassionately in these kinds of conversations? Yeah. Um, I think the most important part of showing up better for me has a lot to do with just paying attention. Um, one of my favorite definitions of prayer is absolute attention is prayer. And I think from a faith perspective or from a secular perspective, we just need to pay attention to all the ways that reproductive health manifests in our lives um, in a deeper way. Um, Everyone has a reproductive story, Mm -hmm. not just folks who have had an abortion, not just folks who have adopted or had a miscarriage, but because we were born from a person who became pregnant, there is a reproductive story there. So I think we just have to show up more compassionately to paying attention to those stories, paying attention particularly to stories that are different than ours. Mm -hmm. And kind of like you mentioned earlier too, Katie, paying attention to our own bodies. It is really heartbreaking for me that it took me so long to realize that I was pregnant because Mm -hmm. I was paying attention to academia or to the grind, or to the pursuit of capitalistic success, rather than hearing what my own body was trying to tell me. Um, So I think the gift that we can give each other in this movement, as it also gets deeper and hotter, is to pay attention to our our own bodies and our, our peers that are parenting during a pandemic still, asking folks how their doctor's appointments are, what their childcare strategies are for the month, um, just kind of paying attention with this deeper lens that also covers our sacred spaces. What are we saying about bodies in our sanctuaries? Um, For me as a Christian, that means that Anytime I'm reading a scripture, I'm asking myself what the bodies in this story are doing. Um, Mm. Obviously, your first book is great to do that. Um, But especially as we are in this interesting um, spiritual space of virtual and in-person and embodied, like we need to center our theology still in this embodiment. Um, And that means paying attention with not just our spirits or our minds, which whiteness makes us do so easily, um, speaking for my own self, um, but we really need to pay attention um, with our bones and our fleshiness and our wombs. And, uh, and I think that's what your book does, Katie. It makes us pay attention to the complicatedness and the sacredness of all of this. So thank you. 
Oh, thank you. And even as you were talking, I'm like, what's going on with my body right now? Could I be a little bit more present? <laughs> Did I drink water today? Yeah. So all of yeah. us who are listening in, just maybe be mindful of how your body feels right now. Yeah. Move around a little bit. Um, well, it sounds like without putting words into your mouth, it sounds like your abortion experience did help you reconnect to your body. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. another part of the, the blessing or the healing that we often don't talk about. And I really appreciate you sharing really openly, even in this conversation about what that experience was like. And I hope you all will, will read Kaylee's story and listen mm -hmm. to her sermon and read her article in the Washington Post, because you are an amazing advocate and faith leader. And I'm so honored that you are part of this project and thank you for your good work in the world doing doing this healing justice that we all need thank you it's an honor thank you so very much kaylee and and so good to have you here as uh, not only an advocate but as a storyteller as alexis said there is a power when we tell story and uh, telling the story is an act of defiance and receiving the story is an act of grace. And so, Katie, now we're going to have some wonderful questions from the audience. And audience, thank you so very, very much for your questions. We wish we had time to get to all of them. We won't, but we will be able to get to probably uh, two or three questions. So first one I want to ask you, who is your dream reader for this book? Who needs this message now? Ooh, that's good. Well, there, could I have two? <laughs> um, and there might be one in the same, but when I was writing the book, I was thinking about people who identify as Christian or were raised in a Christian environment who have experienced abortion and have never felt like they've read anything that might resonate with their personal experiences where they're affirmed for the decision that they made and that their emotions and experience could be held in a nuanced way. So I hope for people who have been longing for that healing, that they see themselves in some of the storytellers. So that's one. And the other are just people who want to be thoughtful about this, who are tired of the ways that we often talk about abortion in very uh, um, divisive, abstract ways, but who also recognize their own kind of moral um, ambivalence about abortion and really want to dig in to understand where those beliefs come from and maybe challenge them a little bit and learn how to hold abortion stories mm -hmm. in a different kind of way, who want to examine the judgments that they have. And like I said, transmute them into compassion. And sometimes those two people are the same person. Um, but really for anybody who, who wants to be thoughtful about this, especially in this political moment that we're in. Thank you. So I'm going to try to squeeze in three questions, okay? Okay. So second question, what were high and low points you experienced as you were writing this, as you were hearing the various abortion stories? And part B to that, were, were there any things that were surprising to you as you heard the stories? Yeah. Okay. Highs and lows of, of hearing. And it was, I surprised by anything. Um, I mean, every single storyteller I talked to, there was an, um, there was an emotional connection with the person and that just that, that trust, that openness, that, um, willingness on the part of the storyteller to, to share with me, oftentimes a complete stranger, this really you know, vulnerable part of their lives. That was always, that was always a gift. That was always a gift mm -hmm. for me. And so I would say every conversation in that way was, was a high. There were a couple of low points, um, but one I will focus on, cause I think it's important and it, I don't specifically talk about it in the book at length, but I was very far into the book writing process when I shared the draft of a story with one of the story storytellers. And she wrote back to me and was really upset with the way that I had depicted her story. Mm. And I felt horrible. I immediately tried to fix it and change it and, and address all of her concerns um, because I was so horrified that I gotten it so wrong. And 
ultimately she decided to not have her story included in the book. And it was a low point for me because I felt like I had failed. Um, and also I was going to have to restructure the book now that I couldn't include this story. But now looking back on it, I think that is precisely what all of this work is about, it is yes. about us having yes. the, the dignity, the agency to change our minds, uh, to make a decision that might be inconvenient <laughs> to someone else, but to really claim our own truth and our own story and decide if, when, and how we want to tell that story. Yes. And yes. so even though it was challenging for me um, to feel like I hadn't done it well, I learned a lot by that person setting that boundary with me. Hmm. And none of us should ever feel compelled to tell something that we're not ready to tell. And so I'm really, really grateful to her for having modeled those kinds of boundaries. Mm -hmm and dignity for self in yes. that decision. So it was a low point at the time, but actually a high point in looking back on it. Um, in terms of surprises, well, there were just some things that I didn't know about pregnancy that I learned. I've been pregnant one time and had a healthy pregnancy and a, and a healthy birth. And just learning about all the different ways that pregnancy can be life-threatening to people. There were just conditions I had never heard of before that I learned about and having talked with some of the people in the book. Um, and it just reminded me that there are so many different reasons why someone might need to have an abortion that we'll never understand or know. And just to be mindful of that and be ready to receive lots of different kinds of stories that might be ones I've never heard before. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm just really grateful to the storytellers for being willing to share in depth about their experiences and all of the circumstances that surrounded them because I learned so much about just how precarious pregnancy can be for people. I think we glamorize it, um, but it, it is in fact life-threatening for people in many different ways. Um, and abortion in that way is very life-affirming and life-saving. And a blessing that it can be. For and a blessing, yes. yes. Thank you. So number three, one of our audience members is transitioning in career now, mm -hmm. uh, male OBGYN, who is moving into providing abortions and, and found your book very helpful. So mm -hmm. the question is, how do I put into practice compassion as a provider. Mm. Wow. First of all, thank you. <laughs> thank you for making this courageous transition to being a provider where we need more providers. So thank you. And thank you for thinking in this way. Um, I imagine that you are already a very compassionate person. So own that. Um, but maybe I'll speak specifically to the spiritual concerns that might come up because what I've seen as someone who was in the procedure room with people is that it's oftentimes a moment when someone will ask a question like, is God going to punish me for this? And what I want to empower you to do as a provider is to affirm the person who's there and that they do know what they need. They can change their mind, but to affirm their goodness and their, their divine worth that nothing can separate them from the love of God, even in that moment, that that's actually a moment when they can experience the divine in really profound ways. So that would be my advice is just, even if you're not a theologically trained person, you have what you need to affirm the person in front of you and to help them feel loved and cared for in that moment in lots of different ways. So I just want to encourage you and, and again, to say thank you for the work that you're doing. We need more providers like you. And I would just offer, if you ever want to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, <laughs> we'll make that happen because I would love to learn more about you, um, but just want to express my gratitude and thank you for the question and for thinking in this way. There are many, many people who are going to be blessed because of your work. So again, there are several questions. Um, one is, are you going? want to do a book tour, if you can say that one really short response to that. 
I would love to do virtual events with local bookstores. Um, obviously with COVID we're limited in terms of traveling, but, um, I am available to do, I have some events in the works right now with some local bookstores, but if there's one that you would like for me to come to and do an event, um, I would love to talk to you about the possibility of doing that. And what about touring with faith communities, with congregations? If someone on in this call is interested in that, is that something you'd be available for? Yes, and I believe it's in the chat. Um, I love uh, calling into book discussion groups. So if that's something that you're interested in, there's a way for you to, well, I also see there's, there is a discussion reflection guide that's available on the Broadleaf website. So there's already some questions that you can have um, for group conversations about the book. And also if I'm available and have capacity, would love to zoom in with your group and talk with, with your folks about this book, because that is how we learn and heal is through conversations like these. So please give it, send an email to info at rcrc.org. And I would love to meet with your group at a time that that works for both of us. Thank you. I'm going to squeeze in one more question okay. with, a part, with a part A and B. Oh gosh. Um, okay. <laughs> the part A is in this context where so much permission is given to anti-abortion rhetoric and, and even violence, verbal and otherwise. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to attacks that come to you, many of them that may be very ugly? That's part A, how do you respond okay. to that? And part B, what gives you hope? Mm. Okay, well, <laughs> I have, I have evolved in how I handle the kinds of attacks that come my way. And they they were starting up today. I could see them. Um, it used to really, um, throw me off balance. I used to take it really, really personally when those things would happen and I would almost absorb them in my body. And so I've, I've learned to distance myself in the sense that they're not really talking about me. Um, it's really about upholding a system of control um, that's very white, that's very male, that's very Christian, and that I threaten that system of power. And so it's not about me, it's about um, me dis working with other people to dismantle those things and to, and to question those, those things. So I've learned to depersonalize it. And I've also learned to find the humor in it because sometimes it's, so ridiculous that you just have to laugh. And so obviously I want to keep myself safe, but when it's just people who are kind of coming at me from all angles, I, I do try to just find the humor in it. And also remember that there are things that I have changed my mind about, and I would be embarrassed of if I went back to my younger self and the things that I used to say. And I just try to trust that everyone is on their own journey. And maybe something that I say now will plant a seed and that person might might change their mind because I haven't, I won't back down. I continue to speak my truth. So that's that. Um, in terms of what gives me hope, honestly, the bravery of the people I got to talk to in this book and the people who serve them day in and day out, um, this OBGYN who just asked a question, like the people who really are providing care day in and day out, especially right now, and the patients who are brave enough to go and access those services in spite of the protesters who harass them, they, they inspire me and give me hope. And I also think the legacy of RCRC, of the clergy consultation service on abortion, of the clergy who before Roe were being so brave in making sure that people got the care that they needed, it reminds me that I'm part of a long legacy of faith leaders who have always made sure that people who need care get access to it. And so I know that I have a part to play in that, but I'm not by myself and I'm not the first. And doing this work in community with amazing people like you, Carrie, and Danya, and Alexis and Kaylee, that gives me hope. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this book launch. And I wanna say to each of you, who have come in today 
to remember something that Katie said, and that is that people are hungry to share their stories, whether it is abortion stories or other issues in their lives. We all have stories that need to be told and that need to be heard. And that each time any one of us allows ourselves to be vulnerable, it inspires and encourages someone else to do so. That's how we help create an environment that truly honors the sacredness of the complicated choices that we make in a variety of ways in our lives. And so please, wherever you are, honor sacredness of choice and honor your own story, honor your own body and honor the stories and bodies of others. If you have not yet received your copy of A Complicated Choice, please do so. You will not regret it. Thank you all so very much for being with us today. And Katie, again, thank you for writing this important book and telling these stories. Thank you. I want to I want to do a few thank yous myself, if that's okay. I know we're running low on time, but um, I want to thank all of you who attended today. Um, strangers, but also colleagues and friends and loved ones, your support means so much to me. Thank you for being here. I want to thank the Greater Good team, Liz, Val, Emily, and others, everybody who helped with the production and getting the word out, um, and to Jessica for helping with the tech support today. Of course, gratitude to Alexis, Donnie, Kaylee, and you, Carrie, not only for being part of this event today, but for all of the ways that you all have supported this book project from early on. I want to thank the RCRC team, Carrie again, and Melanie, and Carolyn, and Darren, and our board of directors for their support. I want to thank my team at Broadleaf Books, my editor, Lisa, and my promo team, Emily and Jana. And lastly, I want to thank the storytellers again, who bravely shared their abortion experiences, not only with me, but with all of you too. I'm very grateful and my heart is very full. So thank you. And so with that, we will have a final screen for you where you get to see who our sponsors are for this. Thank you to each one of you for helping make this possible.